we can go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our next session in the Community Outreach and Engagement Seminar Series. Today, we have two local presenters who are from the Tobacco Research Group who are going to tell us about some of their collaborative research. Dr. Sharon Murphy is a professor of biochemistry, molecular biology, and biophysics at the University of Minnesota. She received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Colorado Boulder, and she initially worked for the American Health Foundation before she joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota, where she's been working on tobacco research since 1996. Dr. Murphy's research is focused on activation and detoxification pathways of nicotine and tobacco carcinogens, with a specific focus on genetic pathways that are involved in nicotine metabolism and racial and ethnic variation in these pathways. She has a long track record of NIH funding and many publications in support of this work. Our other speaker today is Dr. Dana Carroll, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences in the School of Public Health. She earned her PhD in epidemiology from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. She then moved to Minnesota for a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Hatsukami, and she has now transitioned into an independent faculty position. Dr. Carroll's work is focused on reducing health disparities related to commercial tobacco use. And specifically, she's working in partnership with American Indian communities on projects in examining susceptibility to smoking and lung cancer, and more recently has transitioned this work to focus on smoking cessation in tribal communities. Um, and this work is supported by a recent NIHK award. And today, they're gonna give us a great example of community outreach and engagement and how basic science can inform community engaged research. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Jen, and good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us and we'll just jump into our presentation because Sharon and I have a lot to cover today. I wanna first um, acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities was built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. So the Morrill Act of 1862 signed by Abraham Lincoln resulted in expropriated uh, indigenous land being turned into seed money for higher education. And it is now the foundation for land grant universities, including the University of Minnesota. And so for this reason, I always like to start off by acknowledging that um, the land that we work me um, is uh, the traditional homelands of Dakota people and it's important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live learn and work as we seek to improve and strengthen relations with the tribal nations in and around um, Minnesota. So I just wanted to briefly mention um, that there is um, this is the, the Masonic Cancer Center's catchment area is uh, Minnesota and so National Cancer Institute guidelines the cancer centers include consideration of the needs of the catchment area and research across all programs and incorporation of input from community members and organizations in the catchment area to determine issues of particular relevance the long-term goal of reducing the cancer burden in the catchment area and so today i think we'll be giving you a a, a little example of how um, one study in collaboration has uh, tried to meet these um, goals so uh majority of uh, lung cancer and uh, about 40% of cancers are due to cigarette smoking. And we know that in Minnesota, um, cigarette smoking is particularly high among American Indians. This is um, data from about 10 years ago nearly. Um, it's a little outdated, but what it does show is that the smoking prevalence among American Indians and Alaska Natives in present day Minnesota is as high as about 60%. This is compared to the overall population, which is about 16%. And so with that, I'll give it over to Sharon. Okay. So I'd like to talk to you today about some of my work on biomarkers of tobacco exposure and nicotine metabolism and how we use those as tools to investigate individual differences and specifically ethnic racial differences in lung cancer risk among smokers. So just a little background, cigarette smoking um, is still prevalent in the United States in the sense that there are 40 million smokers. 
as Dana said, most lung cancers, as much as 90%, is due to cigarette smoking. It's the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women. And in the upcoming year, there will be estimated a two, over 235,000 new cancer cases um, diagnosed, and the great majority of those will be in ex-smokers. And um, it's an estimated there'll be over 130,000 cancer, lung cancer deaths. <clears throat> now, uh, smoking causes cancer, but only about 11% of females and 24% of males get, who are lifetime smokers will get lung cancers. Um, so there's individual differences in lung cancer risk, and these are reflected in what we're focused on at the moment is the observed racial ethnic differences that exist for lung cancer. <clears throat> so this is a study from a number of years ago, which began some of our work um, using the multi-ethnic cohort, which is a large cohort of five different racial ethnic groups, African American, Native Hawaiian, Latino, Japanese American, and white. And if we just focus on <clears throat> what this is, is a relative risk of lung cancer and looking here at the lower um, reported cigarettes per day and the relative risk um, African-American set at one, um, whites risk is half that for the same number of cigarettes reported, um, whereas Latinos and Japanese Americans is much lower. Now this work's been updated recently and similar relationships still exist. In this population, African Americans, Native Hawaiians, the highest risk, Latinos and Japanese Americans, much lower. So the hypothesis behind all of our work is that ethnic differences in the exposure and response to tobacco smoke carcinogens contribute to observed racial ethnic differences in lung cancer. And this has been supported for the last 10 years um, by the NCI and our program project grant with a number of investigators. So we work under this um, umbrella of the mechanism of tobacco carcinogenesis, where in order to get to lung cancer from smoking, initially you have to smoke. You're exposed to a large number of carcinogens. You may get DNA attic formation, mutation in important genes, and ultimately go on to lung cancer, and there are a number of other players in this process. However, you can't get there pretty much without nicotine, as far as lung cancer caused from smoking, because nicotine which is not a carcinogen, is why people smoke um, to consume more nicotine. Um, what that does is increase smoking, increase smoking or continued smoking, continued exposure to the carcinogens present in tobacco smoke. <clears throat> and the intensity by which people smoke is in part a function of their metabolism of nicotine. You metabolize nicotine more efficiently so it clears faster, you tend to smoke more frequently, more cigarettes, and more often. Um, <clears throat> the enzyme that catalyzes, the key enzyme that catalyzes nicotine metabolism is a P450 enzyme, which we refer to as CYP2A6. The, <clears throat> the reaction that that catalyzes is the major pathway, which is the conversion of nicotine to cotinine, which is referred to as five prime oxidation. Pointer, sorry. at this position generating cotinine. P452A6 activity varies significantly across people, and this is in most driven by the fact that there are more than 50 variants that have been identified um, in different individuals. Among them is a deletion, which is referred to as CYP2A6 star 4, which is common in Asian populations. <clears throat> so this has led to this proposed relationship that we work under that the someone's genotype for 2A6 is related to their lung cancer risk. Genotype will drive the activity of nicotine metabolism catalyzed by P452A6. How efficiently the smoker metabolizes can influence how much or how intensely they smoke. Therefore, someone with low metabolism is exposed to a much smaller extent of tobacco carcinogens and other compounds resulting in a lower risk of lung cancer. So to confirm this relationship, we need to accurately measure both exposure and p 452 6 catalyzed nicotine metabolism. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So what are the pathways of nicotine metabolism? It has three options. The major pathway is p 452 a 6 in most individuals, but in addition, there are two other pathways, formation of nicotine and oxide, 
which is um, catalyzed by an FMO, a flavin monooxygenase, nicotine glucuronidation. So um, I'll, I'll start with some slides and then I'll check back in with Sharon here. So I want to mention, um, this is a, a belief that um, I hold and I um, believe is true with all the communities that are in our catchment area. So American Indian communities and other communities in our catchment area have the knowledge and wisdom to address cancer and public health issues. Communities may just need resources and expert input. So really it's um, often a bi-directional relationship, learning from the community with what their needs are, what they know about the strengths and opportunities um, in their community and then providing our input from the cancer center. So I wanna to mention too um, that my presentation and Sharon's presentation as well refers to the commercial use of tobacco. So in uh, many American Indian tribes and communities, there is use of tobacco for traditional purposes. And this is viewed as from tobacco from being from the creator. Um, it has sacred and medicinal value um, and is often used during prayer or ceremony. And what I um, want to acknowledge is that we're respecting the use of this tradition and today focusing on commercial tobacco use. So um, as I alluded to in my intro is that because of uh, about 80 to 90% of lung cancer cases are due to smoking, um, lung cancer cases in Minnesota are particularly high among American Indians. And this is very recent data from 2020 where you see the lung cancer incidence among indigenous peoples is, is about twice as high as other race groups in our catchment area. And um, for this reason, um, there was a tribe that we developed a collaboration with that was interested in understanding risk for lung cancer among smokers um, and developing approaches to improving smoking cessation. And so this is data from around 2013 as well where you see that about more than two thirds of the tribal members were smoking some days or every day. And um, what I'm gonna do is take a pause and see if Sharon can hear us and is back on. Hi Sharon, can you hear us? I could always hear you. Oh. <laughs> yes, that was very frustrating. Oh, oh. okay, well this is, this um. is perfect. I just provided a little more context from my slides and we'll just bump back yeah. over to you and we'll see how this goes again. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me um, try again um, to find my... Okay, can you hear me and see my slides both? Yes, um, we, there you go, perfect. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure when you lost me, um, but this is the overall relationship that we're interested in looking at, um, which is the 2A6 genotypes relationship to nicotine metabolism, and then to the exposure of tobacco carcinogens um, by way of smoking. Um, and a decreased or increased risk of lung cancer depending on your um, enzyme activity. So <clears throat> nicotine is metabolized by three pathways. It can generate nicotine anoxide, nicotine glucuronide, and <clears throat> by way of P452A6, the major pathway in most individuals, generates cotinine and its metabolites, cotinine glucuronide, transnerodoxycotinine, and its glucuronide. The reason I mention all of these is we quantify those and the sum of those is referred to as total nicotine equivalents and accounts for greater than 85% of the nicotine dose that a smoker receives. So we've done this in the smokers, a subset of smokers in the multi-ethnic cohort among these 2000 smokers, if we're looking here on the left hand, on the y-axis, Total nicotine equivalents, these are arranged in order of lung cancer risk with African Americans having the highest risk. And if we just focus on the three, uh, <clears throat> three groups, which is uh, African Americans, whites, and Japanese Americans, there's a significant difference in exposure as measured by total nicotine equivalents across these three ethnic groups. And this is in contrast to reported cigarettes per day 
where African Americans are reporting an average of 10 cigarettes per day, Japanese 12, but the TNA is um, measured in that urine, which was collected many years <clears throat> and back in the 90s before any lung cancer cases had occurred. Um, it's much different in those two groups and consistent with the lung cancer risk that has been observed. So that's exposure. We're measuring that by using total nicotine equivalents. And then we need a measure of um, P452A6 activity. And as I told you, P452A6 or CYP2A6 metabolizes nicotine to cotinine, but it also is the catalyst of the conversion of cotinine to 3-hydroxycotinine, <clears throat> which are longer lived metabolites so that the ratio of 3-hydroxycotinine to cotinine may be used as a measure of P452A6 activity. And that is a function of genotype. And if we look at just some data from another study that we've worked on just to see how this genotype, this is over on the left-hand side, um, 2A6 genotype, these are various different alleles. And then um, this is relative ratio of total 3-hydroxycotinine to cotinine in these individuals by group. <clears throat> and these are ranked where star one, star one would be <coughs> wild type individuals with no, no variants that we are aware of in this population. And then all the way down here is the star four, which is that deletion allele that I mentioned. And the star seven is also a relatively, <coughs> makes very little enzyme. Um, if you look at how that, very little coping by uh, the enzyme has very little activity. So these can be ranked as normal metabolizers to poor metabolizers. So if we go back and look in the multi-ethnic cohort at this ratio, total 3-hydroxycotinine to cotinine across these five ethnic groups. As you can see, there's variation. And the Japanese, who have the lowest risk of lung cancer, have the lowest ability as a group to metabolize <clears throat> by P using P452A6 relative to whites and African-Americans. So what are the genotypes contributing? So we went on and genotyped um, all the individuals in those 2000 for um, known 2A6 variants. Uh, we chose those, let's just focus on these three groups. We chose those variants based on what was in the literature at the time and what we knew about their effect on metabolism. So again, down here in the red, the star four, that's the deletion. So someone homozygous for that has no ability to metabolize nicotine through the P452A6 pathway. Up here where these individuals have none of the variants that we looked for, and I've ranked these in order of relative activity based on what we know. So again, if you look between these three groups in the Japanese, you can see only a less than a quarter of the population has none of these variants, as opposed to African Americans and whites, where it's more than half. And again, if we look at the red, these essentially non-functional, no 2A6 activity, much greater in Japanese American than these other two groups. <clears throat> the alleles that result in that inactivity might be different across the different groups, but the outcome is the same. No. 2A6 catalyzed nicotine metabolism. In that population, we measured, <coughs> excuse me, all those nicotine metabolites. <clears throat> and so what we have here, again, looking at this three groups in blue, okay, is everything that's going through the coping formation pathway, the 2A6 catalyzed reactions. And the others are the other pathways where red is the nicotine excreted unchanged. So the greatest difference in the population level between these groups is here again, C oxidation pathway is much reduced in Japanese Americans relative to the other groups and the amount of free nicotine excreted, therefore the amount of nicotine that the smoker is exposed to per cigarette is greater in Japanese Americans relative to the other groups. And then if we just look at the subset of Japanese Americans who have, oops, who have no um, P452 is six activity. They're homozygous for this deletion. There's essentially no C oxidation, just 10% of the nicotine dose is excreted from that pathway. And there's a great amount, 40% in this example, of nicotine excreted unchanged. <clears throat> okay, and then if you just look at the ratio, just thinking about that metabolism of the 3' hydroxylation to cotinine, this is about two to one in these two populations, one to one. In Japanese, but in the deleted population, it's 0.2 to 1. So that gives us a measure of activity across those groups. And then we categorize each of those variants as high, medium, or low. And again, uh, looking at the diplotypes, we carry two alleles of each of these, 
you go deleted or low activity to normal, and it goes in the direction we anticipated. So the question we wanted to ask is given this measure of activity, given the measure of total nicotine equivalence as exposure, what is the relationship of one to the other? <clears throat> That's illustrated here on the right for Japanese Americans where these individuals didn't carry any of those variants. TNE exposure was much higher in that group relative to the individuals who carried no active duress. Similar relationship exists in African Americans. Um, there are fewer um, low activity alleles, so the power to see this is less. And then in whites, we actually are not able to see um, much difference across those groups. There are small numbers. So what have we learned? In Japanese Americans and African Americans, 2A6 diplotypes are associated with TNA equals. So smoker who carries low or no activity has lower exposure. They smoke the cigarette less intensely or they smoke fewer cigarettes. We didn't see an association TNA with all the diplotypes across the other groups. This is part due to the low frequency of these genotypes that we're looking for. And in addition, there may be uncharacterized 2A6 variants or other environmental or genetic factors that are going to contribute to both 2A6 activity or nicotine uptake and smoking. So lower levels of 2A6 catalyzed nicotine metabolism results in decrease in smoking, increased exposure. But the question is still, does this variation in nicotine metabolism influence a smoker's risk of lung cancer? So again, in the multi-ethnic cohort, this um, large group of five different ethnic backgrounds, <clears throat> we looked at the relationship of 2A6 activity measured by that ratio of 3-hydroxycodone and copane with lung cancer incidence in those smokers whom we did have these measures on. Um, there were only, at this point, this was in 2017, 92 cases, um, but we were able to see here, what are we looking at? The risk um, by TNE or by 2A6 activity um, <clears throat> rel relative risk. And it's increased significantly with either of these measures. However, if we control one for the other, so in this model three, we're looking at the risk relative to TNE, controlling for activity and it's no longer significantly different since 2A6 activity is mediating that risk. However, the difference is still greater when we're controlling for TNA and 2A6 activity in this population of smokers. And this is now the larger population, meaning all ethnic groups are represented here, although it's small numbers of cases. So 2A6 activity is a biomarker for lung cancer susceptibility. So back to our overview. overview here, we've shown that that's the case in this population. Um, do those differences in exposure explain the variable risk in lung cancer observed in the multi-ethnic cohort? So the last thing I want to show you is some work in collaboration with uh, Dan Stram and others at um, USC who are their collaborators on this program project grant. So we wanted to look at the relationship of total nicotine equivalents to lung cancer in the NIC in the larger population, the over 3,000, 300,000 subjects, sorry, I remember, in that population. And so what Dan did is predict total nicotine equivalents in the larger population based on the values that we had in the 2000, <clears throat> and then use t &E in place of cigarettes per day to look at relative risk of lung cancer. And so now here's the increased risk with age um, for whites. Now Japanese and whites are quite similar. At this TNE of 35 is an average TNE and smokers in this total population. Um, Native uh, American, African Americans have similar risk. Native Hawaiians still we couldn't account for the difference just by measuring TNEs with this model. Um, and Latinos was also small lower risk with the same TNE level. So there was no difference in lung cancer risk across Japanese, whites, and African Americans when we used predicted TNE in place of cigarettes per day as the measure of smoking. These data suggest that the variable risk of smoking related to lung cancer in these two groups is due to differences in tobacco exposure that's not captured by just measuring cigarettes per day.
and Japanese Americans that low or mean TNE level is due to the prevalence of low activity and null 2A6 alleles in that population. However, in African Americans and in individual African Americans or individuals of any ethnic group, low 2A6 activity can be related to lower TME. However, as a group, it doesn't contribute to the mean. It is overpowered by other factors that increase TME levels, um, which are, the, are not identified. So that was a quick <laughs> interrupted overview of some of the work we're doing across multi-ethnic um, different populations and the uh, hope between Dane and I is we can apply some of this similar approach to her work in the American Indian community. And this is a collaborative um, process with a number of investigators and people in my lab listed here. Thank you. Questions or do you want to just move on, Dana? Um, yeah, let's let's move on and I think hopefully we'll we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So if you just want to let's see all Screen now. Okay, great. I'm glad we were able to get you back, Sharon. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned, we were um, in uh, conversation and discussions with a tribe that was interested in um, understanding risk for lung cancer among smokers and as well as um, developing approaches to improve um, smoking cessation because um, quitting is, is very difficult. And in, in the general population, it's about 7% of smokers um, each year are able to quit. So um, the tribe was interested in, in how they could improve upon this for their tribal members. So I just wanna mention that throughout this relationship, we utilized um, principles of community-based participatory research to guide the collaboration. And if I can ever summarize what that looks like, I view this as everyone coming around this table, both the community members, um, community stakeholders, as well as folks like us from the Cancer Center. And there's, there's a puzzle and we're all contributing our knowledge in, um, what, uh, to it. And so we actually um, published a paper on some of our lessons learned working together. And um, if you're interested, I can send that to you, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail today. Um, but I do wanna mention um, the, the, the premise of the CVPR um, research process is um, centered around building and maintaining trust. And of course, this is um, critically important given the history of our land grant university. Um, and um, justifiable mistrust of, of uh, the university due to colonization efforts, as well as justifiable mistrust due to um, some poor experiences of um, researchers um, abusing um, uh, some American Indians in research and in using data for purposes that they that the tribe was not aware of. So there's a long history there to. Um, to, to work and improve and learn from the past. And so building and maintaining trust is, is critical. Um, and so this is just a framework. Essentially, it looks similar to a typical research process, but as you see, the community is involved in all aspects of the research process. And so um, just the first one I wanted to point out was, you know, identifying the priority public health issues for the community and the research questions. And so there was a clear need um, and interest in the high prevalence of commercial smoking. And so as discussions unfolded, it was, you know, is um, higher lung cancer incidence reflective of more American Indian smoking? So there's just a greater prevalence of smoking and therefore greater prevalence of secondhand smoke exposure as well. Or is it that among smokers, um, do American Indians have greater risk for lung cancer and other tobacco related diseases than other um, racial ethnic? So is there something about how um, American Indians are smoking cigarettes or exposure that may um, increase their risk for lung cancer? And as Sharon discussed, this has been a lot of the work that she has been, been doing. So that was um, a, a kind of a, a great way to, to leverage her and others' expertise at the Cancer Center. And then the tribe was also interested in around the time, really the, the buzz of personalized medicine, precision medicine, you know, those terms that are still um, pretty uh, uh, novel and, and used today. Um, the tribe was interested in these um, techniques to um, informing smoking cessation, but also how can we use 
um, genetics to understand susceptibility. So building on Sharon's work um, and, and others that have contributed to that body of work, the tribe was interested in um, how nicotine metabolism may help them understand what contributes to exposure um, among their tribal smokers. And then what was really unique about nicotine metabolism um, that I'll mention here and I'll show you in a slide is that not only can it help us understand um, why certain individuals might smoke greater or more, be more dependent to cigarettes or have higher lung cancer risk, but because of those mechanisms, there's um, uh, other um, uh, groups of researchers that have used um, nicotine metabolism to see whether or not tailoring smoking cessation treatment based on um, that CYP2A6 biomarker, the 3 hydroxyl cotinine to cotinine, can improve um, smoking cessation outcomes. So this was really um, exciting, I think, to the tribe because it was this really clear benefit that they could move toward in developing potentially a program around this concept. So just briefly, um, as I mentioned, uh, the smoking cessation work around nicotine metabolism. Um, so this has um, been uh, numerous clinical trials and these have been done in predominantly white populations that have shown that based on someone's nicotine metabolism, so the, the slow metabolizers who um, represent the, the low or no activity um, CYP2A6 alleles or the, the normal metabolizers, based on this cut point that they've commonly used, um, folks that are slow do, um, they, uh, they actually, they don't necessarily have better quitting success with nicotine replacement therapy versus varenicline. The quit outcomes are similar, but their side effects are lower. So for that reason, um, their side effects are lower on nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, the, this framework would suggest that if you look at someone's nicotine metabolism and they're slow, you prescribe them NRT. Whereas if they're a normal metabolizer, the quit outcomes were actually better for varenicline. And um, that's commonly for a, a chant, it's Chantex, it's a um, prescription medication for smoking cessation. And the side effects were actually lower on varenicline. Um, so this framework has evolved and the tribe was interested in whether this would be helpful or, and more importantly, feasible to pull off in their community, um, just given that there's potential for this. So what we did um, next was design a small pilot study that began to show our um, collaboration together and to generate some data on nicotine metabolism and perceptions around um, using nicotine metabolism to inform care and um, with the goal that that, that would be um, lay the foundation for a larger scale collaboration. I just want to briefly mention that um, there was a lot that went into establishing the infrastructure and safeguards of the tribe to conduct the research. So even before the study started, I think it was about two years of conversations about um, the, the actual research questions, how it would be conducted, um, and, and how um, the data would be used. So I think that just goes to show it's, it's really important to build that trust and then the research hopefully will bear the fruits of that relationship building. And um, we had a memorandum of understanding, which essentially delineates um, the purpose of the study, how we're doing it, just making sure that everyone was on the same page. And that included a data sharing agreement that included um, items such as um, what type of data was being collected, how it was gonna be analyzed, where it was gonna be analyzed and um, disposed of as well. Um, and even um, the protocol for me to be able to present some of the findings, getting approval from the tribe first before they're disseminated. So all of that was in um, our memorandum of understanding. And then what we also did is um, the tribe really wanted to have samples stored on tribal land. So we bought them a freezer to store um, samples collected for the study. And, um, and uh, we also hired an elder, um, Carol Hare, to uh, coordinate the study who was just really wonderful and um, had a lot of knowledge about the community and provided her input on um, all aspects of the study. And when we ran into, for example, recruitment issues, she was, really knowledgeable about how to um, work around those. So then we um, conducted the study 
And essentially this was at the Triads Clinic. Um, this is really a small convenience sample of, um, of smokers that identified as American Indian. Um, as you see there, the sample size is 54. So, so um, just really pilot data. And that involved um, participants going into the, into the clinic, um, completing questionnaires, providing a saliva sample for genotyping CYP2A6, as well as the CYP2A6 biomarker, the 3 hydroxylcotinine decotinine. And then we also collected urine samples that were analyzed for several biomarkers of exposure, some that Sharon mentioned, like TNE, total NNL, which is a biomarker for a potent lung carcinogen, and others. And so um, now here we are uh, almost coming for full circle um, where we're interpreting disseminating results back to the community, which is really important that we don't just take the results and, and, and leave. Um, there is um, unfortunately stories of, of that happening in some American Indian communities. So disseminating back to the community is critical. And then as well as the scientific field. And so just to um, remind you of some of the questions of interest to the tribe. So does CYP2A6 activity predict smoking behavior and exposure, recognizing we have a small sample size at this point? And what we um, were able to show, um, so this is um, data, again, among the 54 participants. And this data was actually just approved by the tribe to, um, for us to, to um, present on it about a week or two ago. So this is fresh off the press. And, um, what we see is that about um, half of the sample were slow metabolizers. And again, this is on that, um, that biomarker. And this is a common cut point used in the literature, about 0.31 um, to distinguish slow versus normal or uh, fast metabolizers. Um, and so we had about a 50-50 distribution. The, the genotyping data um, is underway. So we, we don't have that to present on, but it will be great to see how the genotype relates to the, to the phenotype. And um, one of our key findings is that nicotine metabolism, so that, that biomarker is associated with cigarette dependence. And so this has been shown um, in, in the literature as well, um, getting back to what Sharon mentioned as the pathway, those that are normal or fast um, tend to smoke more intensely. Um, and so what we are showing here too is that um, they're actually more addicted to cigarette um, and this is based on a, a common um, scale used to measure dependence to cigarettes. Um, what we also looked at, as I mentioned, was several biomarkers and um, to look at how nicotine metabolism based on the biomarker contributes to nicotine exposure and carcinogen exposure. Um, and what we, you know, we, we didn't see significant results um, and I, I think this is, we, we truly have a really small sample size, um, but they are in the expected direction where um, with increasing um, that uh, nicotine metabolism, there is some evidence that they're elevated, but these, these were not statistically significant. Um, so another question and kind of innovative spin that we've taken too, as I mentioned, was to look at um, uh, nicotine metabolism and, and how we can use that to inform treatment for smoking cessation. And so what we did is um, in the survey is that we asked people what their preference would be for, um, among people that were interested in quitting, what their preference would be for either the nicotine replacement therapy, like nicotine gum, lozenge patch, or is their preference um, varinoclin or commonly referred to as Tantex. And so what we found is um, here in this graph, so we would ideally want all the slow metabolizers to say, NRT and all the fast metabolizers to say varinoclin. Um, taken together, it's about 50% of the sample correctly matched. So as good as a flip of a coin. Um, and so there is room for improvement um, by actually matching people to the right cessation treatment based on their nicotine metabolism. And what we thought too um, would be interesting is with the goal of leading to a smoking cessation program potentially tailored around nicotine metabolism. What do people think about this? Um, are, are they, uh, they think that's acceptable, that nicotine metabolism would be used to inform their care, for example. 
So just to quickly orient you, this red line <clears throat> indicates a reference um, a group. So this was um, these questions were used in a prior study among predominantly white or black participants. And overwhel overwhelmingly, the majority um, or nearly 100% of those participants said, yes, I think the development of tests to help match patients is great. I approve of using tests to determine how my body breaks down nicotine. Um, I want one to know if the way my body breaks down nicotine makes it harder for me to stop smoking. So all of these, um, these questions getting that acceptability and there were a handful of others and what we saw in uh, this, this reference group um, is that they had high acceptability compared to um, the, the tribal um, smokers that we had in our convenience sample. And so this suggests to us that there might be some barriers or concerns or um, that through focus groups or in-depth interviews that we can um, identify and work with the community to build some solutions. For example, it might just be that they're um, concerned about who would have access to that data, um, their biological sample or um, cost to have that biomarker ran, would it be on them? So there might be some simple um, solutions that we could um, to identify. So lastly, um, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the questions that we were able to start to look at with this data again, is are there differences in cigarettes per day or exposure that might suggest higher lung cancer risk in American Indian smokers compared to other populations? And if you recall, Sharon um, showed that the cigarette per day um, measure doesn't fully capture, doesn't capture well um, exposure because um, uh, people can smoke cigarettes differently. So um, what we showed in our data and this is actually shown pretty consistently in the literature is that um, American Indians smoke fewer cigarettes per day. Um, around 14, it was about 14 in our sample. And so it often would come up with, well, they're smoking fewer cigarettes, so why is lung cancer so high in this population? Um, and what we were able to show, um, similar to what um, Sharon showed among African Americans, is that if we look at that measure of total expo uh, nicotine exposure at a per cigarette basis, American Indians are actually, or at least the, the sample, they're smoking um, each cigarette more intensely and getting um, higher levels of nicotine. People smoke for the nicotine, but then die from all of the harmful constituents. So we see that also total NNL, which is a biomarker for a potent lung carcinogen, follows that pattern. And so, um, when we actually look at overall exposure of TNEs and in, in that biomarker, they're, they're quite similar. Um, and so something that I and others have been thinking about is these are, these are biomarkers in the, um, the urine. But it'd be really interesting to see how this greater smoking intensity, so either drawing harder on each cigarette, taking more puffs, smoking more of a cigarette, um, how the toxicants and carcinogens distribute in the lung tissue and actually impact um, uh, the lung, which obviously is not being captured here with the biomarkers that we looked at. So um, this is of, of interest to further pursue. So some summary and um, um, next steps of this data and, and this collaboration. So again, it's um, first and foremost, disseminating the results back to the community. So we um, just recently drafted a letter of all of these aggregate results and what we know or what we don't know um, from the data. And we have, um, are going to send that to the research participants um, to make sure that they're educated on the findings. We're also um, exploring options um, to educate the, the tribe's um, health professionals and community. Um, the tribe has a newsletter. And so we're thinking about ways to um, show some of the findings there. Um, and then, of course, um, publishing manuscripts in scientific, in scientific journals. And then what we're also moving toward um, is discussing with the tribe and, and other interested American Indian communities how to, um, what this data can set us up for in the future. And so an uh, obvious one from the results that we got was um, conducting focus groups to better understand perceptions and barriers to nicotine metabolism-informed care. Um, is one way and also in increasing the sample size to be able to further understand 
um, uh, the potential greater risk for lung cancer among smokers um, and the role of nicotine metabolism. So that is kind of where we're at. Again, we just um, recently started analyzing this data. So um, it's exciting to, to present it to you guys today. And I want to acknowledge several folks who um, have made this um, collaboration possible. The Minnesota Cancer Clinical Trials Network um, has been phenomenal in, in helping us um, uh, provide the organizational capacity and the resources to the tribe to conduct the study. And then I have several of my colleagues and mentors here that have um, contributed to the study as well. And with that, I think we'll take questions, which we have about nine minutes, it looks like. So people can either type their questions into the Q&A or um, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I think Sharon, if you're still with us, you could. There you are. You're muted. <laughs> yeah. Dana, can you see the Q&A module? It looks like Kiara oh. put a question in there. Kara asked, um, what sparked your collaboration with Dr. Murphy's nicotine metabolism research that ultimately led to the tobacco cessation work? Um, that's a great question, Kara. I think, um, you know, we all are involved with projects through the tobacco research programs. We have a, a good understanding of what, what folks are doing. And um, speaking with the tribe, it was really this interest in personalized medicine or using genetics to inform um, susceptibility to smoking and lung cancer. And with Sharon's expertise, it just it just really lined up well. Um, so I think just through through conversations and listening to what the community wanted and also telling the community some of our expertise um, ultimately kind of sparked this collaboration. But I would say, you know, if the community had decided to go in a whole different direction, you know, maybe um, some other substance abuse area that we would have then um, provided them with uh, additional expertise. So it's really listening to the community, making sure that the, the community um, needs are being addressed. Um, it looks like Marie asked a similar question. Okay, hopefully we answered that. And um, again, you know, Sharon and I, we've, we've known each other's work. We've both worked with Dorothy Hatsukami. Um, so um, it was kind of this natural collaboration. Um, but I think, you know, any time to leverage a networking experience, um, you know, conferences are not necessarily in person now, but just to get to know others at the Cancer Center can um, open up new ways to think about research collaborations. And it looks like, Sharon, there's a question for you um, from Logan. Shouldn't normal metabolizers be in the middle of the distribution? And I'm not sure if Logan's still on, if he can provide a little more context to that. Yeah, I don't. Know. There's Logan. <laughs> hey, I was just curious. You said normal metabolizers, and then you had intermediate and everything lower. But it looked like the the modal person is uh, somewhere in the in the middle, obviously. So you're you're calling it normal, and um, but really they're high metabolizers. It's oh, more right. of a ter terminological that. difference than anything else. Yeah, you're yes. You're asking what is normal essentially. <laughs> right. And so there would be people at the higher end as well, which could be genetically driven also because there are duplications in this gene um, so that you could have more protein um, and more enzyme. Great. And then I guess we did follow up actually in that population. So they were follow up question. Do, do you ever worry about uh, telling someone that they're a fast metabolizer and therefore they should feel free to smoke with abandon? I know you don't say that, but do they, you worry that they get that message? The opposite, right, Logan? Oh. Um, well, that's sorry. Wh whoever's on the good end of metabolizing, <laughs> you know. I, uh, Logan, we actually asked that question. 
question. I don't know if that was one of the three I showed you, um, but we asked that question to the, the American Indian smoker that if they were to find out they were faster metabolizers and therefore um, there's also some data I didn't present on that they have just a harder time quitting in general um, because they're more addicted, they're smoking more. Um, if that would deter them from quitting. Um, and we, we got kind of a, a mixed bag of, of um, responses. And I think that would furthermore be why it would be really important to make sure whatever messaging that we're giving them um, doesn't have any unintended consequences. And so developing that alongside um, the community with you know, actual smokers at the table and how they're interpreting um, information or guidance on nicotine metabolism, I think is a huge area and, um, and an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And then um, looks like we have a question from Rebecca Pratt. Um, I wonder if you can reflect on what you see as the next steps. Yeah, so um, obviously uh, COVID is here um, still as we are now almost a year from the initial stay at home order. Um, and so um, the, the ability to, um, you know, think about what the tribe's priorities are, you know, really that's the priority for the tribe right now. Um, and there's been also some new, some new leadership change. So all of these things, um, just being clear that we're respectful of the tribe's wishes. Um, and so I um, would anticipate though there is, um, especially as we educate more on these findings as a community, um, interest in doing some, some focus groups, either with the tribe or other American Indian communities to understand how to, again, um, and, uh, identify barriers um, to this type of smoking cessation approach. Another, um, you know, it's, it's really the American Indian communities um, request culturally tailored smoking cessation programs. Um, and so how we can ultimately move toward this like personalized medicine approach, as well as providing um, culturally tailored content, such as on um, the use of commercial versus traditional tobacco um, is, a, is an important area to distinguish in smoking cessation programs. And those are not readily available to many tribes because of resources. So I think I'm envisioning personalized, that's really personalized to the individual, but also the culture of the individual. So working, working toward that. Um, but um, just seeing if that's of interest to the tribe or other um, areas. So for example, I have another collaboration that um, they are interested in mobile devices for smoking cessation. And so we're, we have a grant in to tailor a mobile device. Um, so it's kind of, it's an exciting place to be, um, having a, a toolkit and um, being able to, to listen to the community. And looks like Marie, um, what could MCC and or the university do to better support or lift up this kind of work? That's a great question, Marie. Um, I think this, um, I, I think um, prioritizing or, um, you know, people do what's rewarded. And I think in general, um, community engagement timelines are not um, well understood unless you're doing it. And so this type of work, as I mentioned, we had two, maybe even three years before an MOU was signed, which I think is justifiable for that community given the, the history. Um, and so thinking about how the university can support planning through, through some small planning grants, um, as well as um, recognizing community engaged work um, through our tenure and promotion process, I think, is um, another area that can be improved upon. And um, I would also say, you know, for me, I kind of fumbled into CBPR and learning these techniques. Um, and I know there's many folks at the university who would be interested in um, working alongside communities. So providing basic training on, you know, well, one, what's the history of the university? Um, with regard to research and communities, 
um, but then also providing training on community-based participatory research principles, um, I think is, is important to, to think about how we can do that better. And Marie, um, we, I mean, I could, I could go on forever. So, <laughs> um, but I think we're past time. Yep, I think I'd like to, to end by thanking our speakers and everyone for the great, great questions. And I look forward to seeing the future of, of your collaborations. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.